Hello everyone and welcome back to the first episode of the Impulsive Podcast in 2024. So today joining us, we have a very special guest, Keith Tsai, who is a senior journalist and he'll be sharing more about his perspective on media, China and many other things. So Keith, since this is the first time you're on our podcast, maybe you could introduce yourself to our listeners. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Uh, this is Keith, and uh, I've been like working with uh, like different types of like international media. I said from the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, like uh, on China related affairs, like you know, including politics, policies, diplomacy, like tech policy, so you can name it. Over the past like nearly twenty years, and uh, so like I first started like in Beijing for like roughly ten years, then moved to Singapore for seven years. So yeah, I mean, like uh, anything about like China related, I think uh, I have like uh, some sort of like, uh, you know, like uh, reporting over the years. Mm. 20 years. Wow. That's the, the that's the period that uh, the lots of things have changed in China and outside the perception about China has changed. Um, I mean, evolved dramatically uh, over the last 20 years because of various things happening, etc. So now you have, I mean, you, you mentioned that you were in Beijing, you moved to Singapore, and now you are in the sunny side, Silicon Valley? The Bay Area. The Bay Area. Okay. Well, Palo Alto, yes, I'm calling from Palo Alto, but yes, I'm in the Bay Area, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously, I mean, in Singapore, I mean, uh, end of the year, beginning of the new year is the rainy season, so it's quite um, quite gloomy here, but, uh, but I guess in Palo Alto, it's, it's sunny. Well, I mean, like, it's actually raining here today as well, but uh, oh, okay. hopefully in another few days, we'll come back to the, the, the sunny season, but uh, now it's definitely raining. Yeah. Mm. But, but it's interesting, like, uh, over 20 years, I mean, how do you see, uh, like, the whole media thing evolve over the last 20 years? Because nowadays we, we get bombarded with, uh, with information, and that, that's something which is not new, but there's something that which, which we probably can't resolve because we continue to have more and more information sources. And, uh, and, and for me, a judgment, um, at least for me, has become actually a bit harder if we just rely on media sources. What was your perspective? Yeah. I mean, now you're out yeah. of media, you can probably talk more freely. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, uh, I think uh, the past 20 years, like, you know, like, instead of from like media internally, it's more from like how we see from like, the audience perspective. Because uh, mm -hmm. in lots of cases, like how media report on China, it really depends on like how much or what kind of information that audience wants to read about China. So I can say like when I first started, that was before the Beijing Olympics in 2008. So I started sometime around 2006, you know, 2005 to report on China. And uh, so in, like, okay, so like, let me step back a little bit. Like if you look at the whole, you know, like a whole 20 years, I think there are like three period of time. The first one is really like, you know, like uh, the time surrounding like the Beijing Olympics time. So that was a time like, you know, like globally, lots of people like from different parts of the world, the first time for them, like, okay, Beijing is something, you know, like a directly jumped to, into their mind. Because before that, before the Beijing Olympics or before that period of time, China to many people is just like a far, you know, far east, like Asian, ancient country. They don't really know much about China, maybe apart from like pandas, you know, Great Wall. I mean, like uh, even Great Wall may be beyond lots of people's knowledge. So <laughs> people don't really know much. But at the same time, like, you know, like uh, we had this like financial crisis, you know, like and also like we had the Beijing Olympics. So that both of the events actually brought Beijing or China into people's attention. And it's almost like all of a sudden they realize, oh my God, look at this country, you know, like uh, they're so big and uh, they have like all kinds of like, or they're starting to make all kinds of implications towards, you know, like uh, where I'm living, whether it's like in Europe or whether like in the, in the US, you know, elsewhere like in the world. That's the first time I think like people really started to have this like, you know, very broad understanding about China. And then for that time, like, you know, what they're trying to get from media, you think about it. It's like, you know, like your first time you're trying to like get to know about someone. So basically you want to not read or watch anything about this place. As in like, you know, all kinds of quirky and weird stuff. You know, do people there like actually eat dog meat? You know, that's <laughs> like one of the stories. Are there like, yeah. you know, like cancer villages, for example? You know, like mm. how the environment pollution, do people really like that? Like, you know, living like that? So all sorts of questions were surrounding to this kind of topics. 
Mm. And uh, that lasts for some years, like, you know, and that was also the time, like, lots of international media started to send their people, like, to Beijing, you know, like, uh, that was definitely a boom of uh, international, like, foreign, me like, agencies, like, staying in Beijing. The reporter-wise, you know, like, uh, media coverage-wise, that was, like, the, 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 the starting of the, the whole entire baby boom era. And then, like, uh, the situation lasts for some years, you know, come to the stage of, like, say, like, 2012, you know, like, uh, sometime around that. You know, that was the time, like, people, like, had enough, you know, like, uh, about, uh, you know, those, like, quirky, weird news. And they, 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 and also, like, you know, if we think about from, like, the Wall Street, from, like, you know, financial sectors and the business sectors, there are a lot more interactions between China and the West or like China and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So that part become like, you know, the transition started from like, you know, what is China to something about, you know, like, tell me more about China. So that's where like, you know, like uh, not only like in media organizations, but like also like, you know, like in the case of like, so, so for example, like China experts are overseas, right? I mean, like uh, that's the part like, you know, like you can see media covering China, they start to cover like, all kinds of aspects. And that means like, you know, politics, you know, microeconomy and the finance, you know, different industries like tech and so and so. And also like for like, you know, China experts like globally, it's the same. You know, previously, like as long as I can speak Chinese and people can identify me as, uh, as a China expert. But I think sometime around like, you know, like uh, 2010, 2012, you know, like uh, I think that's the time like, you know, like there will be like there, there were like Chinese experts on like a microeconomy, for example. And there mm -hmm. are like uh, experts pr pr precisely focusing on Chinese mi military development, for example. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I mean, like uh, there are more and more like, you know, like uh, interest towards China. And that's like uh, from all kinds of aspects, because, you know, so like that's also the time like Chinese companies started to make acquisitions and investments, everything like overseas, right? So, and also like more people come into China for travel, like, you know, like tours and everything. So what I'm saying is that that's the time that people started to realize, oh, you know, like some parts of my life has something to do with, uh, with this country. So I want to know more. So that's the time like, uh, you know, like from media pers perspective, you know, that's the best business like to report on China because people in this mood, that is, you know, tell me more, like, tell me more everything, like, you know, about this country. So that's like, I would say like a phase two. And uh, that like, I think the peak area would be sometime around like 2015, you know, like uh, when some of the Chinese conglomerates, like including Anbang and others, right, started to make like mm. massive acquisitions overseas, you know, like, uh, and that really applied to all kinds of sectors. I mean, like, uh, you know, like in Europe, in the U.S., particularly, like people started to aware, you know, oh, my God, like, oh, what, what is going on with this economic superpower in a way that, you know, like uh, these countries realize how big the Japanese economies were like, you know, back in the 1980s. <laughs> so that's uh, that's phase two. And now we move to the next stage, which is, I think, the transition started from sometime around 2021, actually, like only about like two years ago, or like 2020, maybe like, I mean, like, I'm just giving this like rough idea of the time frame. But uh, I think that's the moment, like, you know, like when China, you know, like uh, punished DD for their IPO, for example, and all these like changes, like, uh, you know, like uh, in the uh, tech, tech, uh, regulations as well as like education, like all kinds of sectors. That's where like, you know, like uh, the, the Wall Street in the US and all the other like, you know, companies in the West, they started to realize, okay, uh, this country is like, becoming like too risky for my investment. So I need to find mm -hmm. diversified uh, solutions. And, uh, and that's also like the time, like, you know, this whole decoupling between the two largest superpowers of the world, the China and the US, they started to evolve. And uh, so I think like for now, like it become a stage that, you know, like the audience, you know, like mm -hmm. they don't really want to know all kinds of like fundamental issues about China because it's like, they don't really have like skin in the game or like whenever they try to make a investment, they're not really considering new investment. So if they don't, consider new investment, why they bother, you know, like uh, to, to know more about this country. 
Yeah. That's a very interesting summary of the sort of three phases of the evolution of China in media, right? And you've been covering China for about two decades. What do you think are some common misconceptions that you see maybe back then versus now? And how are they different or how are they similar? That's, uh, that's uh, something I've been reflecting over the past like few years as well. So one thing definitely is like, for example, the current thing is uh, if you look at media, actually I spoke to lots of people like in the Silicon Valley as well. You know, like uh, lots of like readers, like they look at uh, all the coverage of media, they will be like, oh, you know, China, China's AI is massive. I mean, like, uh, like uh, people, lots of people argue like China's AI is much more like stronger compared to the US ones, which uh, I don't think is true. I think it's really far mm -hmm. from the fact, but uh, if you read from media coverage, I mean, like I, what I'm saying is like English media coverage. That's definitely some of the like conceptions, like from uh, misconceptions from, from the public. And uh, the reason why I think it's largely because, you know, like uh, there's a tendency, like, you know, like because the China threat as a uh, as, uh, as theme, right? So there's def so definitely like over the past few years, there's uh, like a strong tendency that uh, to portray China as like, a, you know, like a, evil or like a very strong force i think the even evil part we can you know like put that aside but whether china is like that strong or not i think that's really questionable it'd be like it'd debatable but uh, in lots of cases when media cover like china i mean like in a way they have to say oh this is a very you know like a strong nation they can do this do that you know like all these things but whether like China can deliver like those uh, expectations from like uh, international media, I think that's definitely like questionable. So China's AI, I mean, for example, is not as strong as uh, what media can like portray. Or the other thing is like you know China's soft power. I think that's uh, probably the most uh, obvious obvious case. I mean, like uh, if China's soft power is really that strong, I mean, like. Uh, then like you know like china gonna have a different image like globally whereas like as we know like china's soft power is like uh, maybe pushing like uh, the the perception towards that country like you know, elsewhere like you know in a different direction so i think like all these are very like uh, obvious and typical examples for that strong evil power and uh, and of course people want to is that people want to know about things being evil or just uh, portraying something as, as, as evil actually sells? You, you mentioned just now media is a business, right? And, uh, and, and, and of course, um, people rely on media for the trust. Uh, so at the end of the day, there's always a, a fine balance. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a topic which has been discussed over and over. And how do you, how do you maintain that balance on what sells and, um, and, um, and what is actually objective? I think it's really like one of the things like, you know, like uh, it's very hard to come to like one conclusion, like, I mean, like one simple conclusion. I mean, like uh, definitely like, you know, like the whole misconception towards China, like, you know, like uh, as we were saying, like the strong, like, you know, almighty powerful country or the, 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 the party, you know, like I think this whole idea is really from, you know, caused by different reasons. But like one side, of course, you know, like, uh, I mean, like from the Chinese government perspective, they're never really able to tell their stories well. I mean, like mm -hmm. uh, that's something they're really bad at, really. And mm -hmm. uh, also at the same time, because the distrust, distrust between like China and the U.S., you know, like there are not many like international media reporters are still based in China. So what I'm saying, like, you know, like if you read, read the stories about China these days, you know, like lots of the stories are really about like, you know, the, the power, you know, the party, the government, you know, but yeah. uh, you don't really have the ordinary people like in the story. And uh, that also because, you know, like how that partially because like China, both China and like the, the whole global geopolitical issues have made uh, reporters like, you know, from international media like to operate in China very tough. So like, it's very hard to get any like ordinary Chinese to speak to international media, not to mention like, you know, like uh, give some like very interesting or strong anecdotal quotes. So what I'm saying is like uh, the missing elements of like ordinary Chinese is, uh, is, uh, is definitely there. And that's also contribute to this, like, you know, very broad and, uh, you know, like a sweeping narrative. Mm -hmm. So, 
And I know, I know, of course, like, you know, lots of reporters like these days, I mean, like, because they're reporting from elsewhere, right? And, uh, I mean, they're not really like speaking the language at the same time. And, mm -hmm. or many of them, they're not really speaking the language, like how much they can, they can learn or how much you can know about this country, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, certain, you know, certain case, I think like, you know, like it's similar to like, I, I, like there's an anecdote, like back in the days, like during the cultural revolution. So basically at the time, like, you know, like the foreign reporters, they all had to base in uh, Hong Kong to write about China. And uh, of course, there's very little like, uh, you know, channels, you can know what's go you can understand what's going on in Beijing. So how people would do that. So like what people would do is like, I mean, reporters at the time, what they would do is like they read the uh, People's Daily or other like official like media and trying to look at all the pictures appeared in the front page of, uh, of the People's Daily and see like who's missing. So if this official, senior official missed the from like, you know, the front page of the People's Daily for like a week, let's say, mm -hmm. then like uh, they can just try to come to a conclusion, write a story, say, oh, this guy might be in trouble, blah, 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 you know, like that kind of story. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not saying like right now it's like in a similar stage. I, I'm not saying right now it's in the same stage, but definitely it's in a similar stage. As in like people are reading tea leaves about what's going on in China. You mean previously, many years ago, I mean, because people didn't have enough access to also what's happening with ordinary people in the country, the real businesses and the stuff, I mean, the stories that they get is, is limited. They, they, they try to speculate, speculate based on, uh, I don't know, the, the, the few signs that's coming out and also, and also some, 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 some judgments, right? I mean, so it's important to have this person to face on people's daily, etc. And of course, there was a phase where there were lots of journalists in China, and they, they speak with ordinary people. They report on stories, and uh, and of course, I mean, the eating dog, or whatever. But it shows that it shows a three-dimensional sign of the society that people people can get a sense and, and make a judgment. But now um, it's, it's becoming again a little bit more abstract because you don't get enough information, and uh, a, a few narratives will dominate. So you don't have you don't have this like a full like three-dimensional. Um, some sort of uh, different perspective narratives than showing you and letting you to make your own judgment. Yes, and what's even worse is that, you know, like the whole like Twitter, social media thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, like there are, there are like random accounts, you know, like on Chinese language, social media or like English, whatever, like on Twitter, right? And those report like, uh, I mean, accounts, they may have like random rumors, like make up like, you know, random stuff mm -hmm. and uh, they publish it. And then like, you know, like uh, some like Chinese readers or like Chinese audience, like overseas, you know, like uh, they read those uh, rumors. And then what they're going to do is like, they're going to pass like to their like friends or whatever relatives back in China through like say WeChat and other channels and say, oh, I saw this. This is like interesting. I saw this. And then because like, it's like from like overseas, like people, sometimes people domestically, they will be like, oh, that's interesting. It might be true because, you know, like from like my friend, you know, like, uh, like uh, from like a US and he heard about this, this could be true. And then like what is more interesting is that, you know, like that these people, right, when this becoming like circulated as like, a rumor like, domestically in China, you know, like there will be like, channels to pass this information like to people overseas. I mean, in this time will be the English speaking audience. Mm. So like uh, for the English speaking audience, they'll be like, oh, you know, like uh, I heard about this, like from like my friend in China, it must be true. Right. And then this thing like can somehow like turns like become a coverage on international media because, you know, like uh, it flows like everywhere, you know, like uh, so like reporters, you know, now based overseas, they may like start to report this. And then like once the media actually reported, it's pretty much like a, 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 like a recognition saying, OK, this is a fact. This is true. So that's the whole like cycle in lots of cases made the rumor like become like, a, you know, like a, a public knowledge. 
Oh, 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 I mean, you just described how how fake news uh, came about I mean, <laughs> without the, the deliberate sort of uh, sort of, sort of uh, actions uh, at the back. Um, but I, I think just now what you mentioned about um, the, the AI thing, right? So so people think, okay, uh, AI in China is more advanced, it's massive. Um, I, I think you you must have lots of friends who are working in the AI sector in China. I have lots of friends as well, and. Uh, and what they, they have been, at least what, what my friends have been telling me, the challenges they face, uh, sometimes a bit desperate. I mean, not, not desperate, but sometimes they feel that, okay, they're, they're very envious of companies in the US which can actually develop the, 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 the models and they, they are blocked down with enterprise clients who may or may not pay. So, um, and, of, and on, on the other hand, they have like investor sort of pressure for them to grow the top line. So, so, so they even get more, more blocked down with enterprise customers. And that kind of stories actually do not get out at all. And um, for instance, I mean, since time, the founder passed away uh, a few days ago, right? Um, but people, people talk about since time, they talk about, okay, it's, it's spying on the Uyghurs, it's, 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 I don't know, it's bought by, I don't know, different countries using that for, for, the, for the surveillance state. But, uh, but, but nobody seemed to care about the business model of this company and the struggles they have, right? I mean, mm, they try to build their own, oh, own sort of proprietary technology, and uh, and but but somehow because of whatever reasons, they they don't have that luxury that uh, that AI companies in the US would have. I think uh, analogy could be made in uh, in something like you know like uh, I suppose you have some ex girlfriends, Jiang Kan. I suppose. Uh, Let's say we, like we, you we know. We don't need to post that. I think I think I think I think everybody would. I mean that. like. Uh, yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is actually that, you know, like uh, you can compare like, you know, like uh, let's say I break up with uh, like, like, you know, this girlfriend. How much of her life would you still want to know? And how much details would you still like to learn about this person's life? Maybe not so much. Like you care about like, you know, whether this person like, you know, she's uh, she still like has a good life or not, maybe. But largely, that's about it. You don't really care about, like, you know, like the, like, you know, what kind of food she eats, you know, what kind of like drinks she's having every day. Like, if those are not your business anymore. So what I'm saying is that, you know, because of the lack of uh, investment interest between like China and the U.S. or between the investors and business people from both sides, and uh, people don't really care about you know like uh, the business or lots of, i mean i i when i say like people i'm i'm making it more generic i mean of course there will be people that still care about it, but i'm just saying talking about the general public i think the general public they lost interest like to know like all these like details because you know like for example like uh, like since time like the model struggles and this and that I mean, first of all, I mean, like, uh, why would an uh, ordinary reader from the U.S. would, like, would, would care, right? I mean, they don't have skin in the game. They're not making investment because it's bad, actually, like, in the U.S., right? So they can't really make any investment, so they don't care. And even, like, for uh, companies, you know, like, uh, I mean, like, uh, Shein or Timu or all these companies, right? In lots of cases, these discussion is really about like you know their connections like with uh you know like xinjiang cotton or like so and so on so on and so forth it's not really about like you know like their business model you know why they can sell the cheaper stuff it's like in lots of cases people are coming to an easier conclusion and say oh you know like uh, they use cheap labors they use like uh, you know like uh, cheap cottons but which actually those are not necessarily the truth it's, uh, it's, I think it's also like, I think largely what I'm saying is like, you know, like the, the luck of the reporting or the luck of the curiosity towards, you know, the details, because it's like, there are very limited, you know, like uh, economic interactions between the two sides. And uh, so if the readers don't really care much, why the media should care? Mm -hmm. We we say there's limited economic interactions, but what we have seen is that the, the trade is still growing, and uh, and obviously with uh, with companies like Timu etc. So 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 the supply chain of China is um, is is trying to expand, or, or, or because of its overcapacity, and there are facilitators trying to help them expand across the globe. 
So, uh, so e economically, I think uh, I, I think it's intertwined, right? Uh, so, so it's, um, it's it's not exactly just limited. Uh, how, how, how yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, like the supply chain, of course, like China has like the strongest supply chains like in the world, and that's no problem, right? That makes uh, like actually, as you were saying, like Timu and Xi and all these companies like uh, flourish. And uh, what I'm saying is really about like you know you think about like for like MNCs, like you know like international big companies from the West, are they still mm -hmm. making a lot of new investments in China? So if I'm not making a lot of new investments in China. Why should I want to know every details about this country? And uh, for the logistic part, it's like I buying things from you. Right? All I care is whether you can pay me the money. If you, I mean, like whether you can deliver the goods. And if you, as long as you can deliver the goods, that's okay. I don't care about anything else. So like the, I mean, like uh, there are lots of discussions over the past, like say, like a few years, ever since uh, the trade war. But uh, actually, like you know, like. Uh, Supply chain decoupling is probably the hardest, mm, but yeah. that doesn't mean much. That doesn't mean much. I mean, like it's like China, and U.S. They still have lots of conversations in the senior leaders level, right? And they have like conversations in any other channels as well. But like, so what, right? Like you know, if you look at uh, back in the days, you know, between Soviet and mm. the, the U.S., there mm. were lots of like communication channels as well. But it doesn't stop them like getting into the cold war. So what I'm saying is like the supply chain like uh, has always been there, like you know, and will be there be, unless you know like the companies they find a way to diversify all their supply chains from China to elsewhere, which is extremely extremely tough because you know you look at all the supply chain, it's not built over the past year. It's actually something built over the past like 20, 30, 40 years, right? So I mean like uh, that's part like it's really hard to get replaced. But that doesn't mean the two sides yes, have like a very intimate, yes. you know, relationship. When the, the prevailing narrative has become abstract, uh, I, I think two specific questions. I mean, first, obviously, for for people whose whose lives are still get impacted. I mean, for people who I don't know, say, if you are an American business competing against Timu in the US, um, how do you get the sort of accurate understanding about exactly what's powering them. Uh, I mean, I talk about this uh, because in 2017, I remember when I was, I was in the Middle East, um, and that's when the e-commerce the e companies there started seeing like competition from Chinese companies, cross-border companies, like you no know, Jolly Shake back then, Xi'in was emerging, and, uh, and, and it's very hard for them to get information about what's really going on behind these companies. So, so, so they had, uh, of course, I mean, you, you wouldn't find much coverage or you wouldn't find like much detail in the coverage in media and, um, and, uh, and, and it's difficult for you to actually go there and, I mean, go to the country and, and figure out things yourself. So, 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 so when that happens, I mean, what can people do if, if, if your life is still impacted, you still, you still has, has a connection to the country and with all this like, uh, you know, abstract sort of, Image uh, messages portraying the evil power and uh, and and things, and, and for for me, I have almost like you no know, been trying very hard to resist resist the headlines, right? Because because headlines anchor your perspective about things, and if you if if you if you believe too much in the headlines and what you're understanding might be very different from from the reality, and sometimes you need to make decisions based on based on that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, like, I, I think that really depends on, like, who, who are we talking about? I don't think the general public, they care much about, like, you know, what is actually going on, right, if you think about it. I mean, like, I only, like, the, the, like, the only thing I care is, like, whether I can get cheap goods from, let's say, Timo or, like, Shein, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really care, like, you know, like, uh, the logic behind it. And uh, also, like, for... I think like for for lots of the people, I think like in elsewhere, like outside of China, I, I don't know. I mean, like uh, even like from the company's perspective, I mean, Western companies, I mean, the market is still like you think about the overall market at large, mm -hmm. it's big enough to have like multiple players. So mm -hmm. I think like, you know, like in a way that, uh, of course, that she and team are big, but it's not necessarily like that to say like they replace Amazon like and others or Walmart or Target, you know, like they, they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And uh, so, and then like we come to the stage that, you know, if we think about it, the people who actually like care is, uh, is, uh, is becoming like a very small group of people that, you know, like either the founders of like, you know, like all these, I mean, founders of like, you know, like the stores on Shopify, for example, mm. or like, you know, like uh, the, the CEO executives of, uh, you know, Walmart, you know, like uh, Target, Amazon, like so and so and so forth. So I think that the, the, the group of people is very limited after all. And those are like some investors, for example, right? They're making investment towards like PVD and others. And for those people, they're gonna do lots of like uh, detailed examinations beyond headlines, as you were saying. So like for those people, like uh, the, of course, there are this kind of people, but all I'm saying like is that the, 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 the size who actually want to know more about China has shrunk dramatically over the past few years. And, uh, and the headlines, I mean, like, it's just like, uh, it's the nature of the business became, I mean, like, uh, everybody has to fight for the screen time. And uh, so does the media. And mm. uh, I mean, how does media can compete with, uh, you know, like, uh, the much more like, sexier headlines from the uh, TikTok, you know, and uh, social media, it's getting very, very tough. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, I mean, media as I don't know, objective kind of, I mean, sort of coverage with certain standard, that's, that's definitely, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost irreversible, right? I mean, you were limited to a smaller audience who still want to be more informed uh, compared to people who are driven by headlines because you, you're saying that you can't, can't compete against TikTok headlines. Yeah, but like, I mean, like uh, from, I think like largely like media, right, it's for public interest. So in a way that media has always been right for the public, then like right for like a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's this uh, untouchable. And the other part, I think, you know, like, uh, like it's not really, I mean, like, I think largely like media reporters, like, uh, you know, like covering China, there are like, you know, like, uh, or they're trying to be not biased. They're trying to be like, you know, like provide uh, the nuanced views. I, I, I still like trust that like, many of them, they have the good intentions. Mm. But the challenge is like, you know, when you have very limited access about this country, you know, like that you're reporting on, how would you do? I mean, like, uh, how would you trust, you know, some of the sources you got, you know, like uh, the information you got? It's a very tough decision to make after all. And also, like, uh, I think if you think from the reporter's perspective, I mean, like, even like ordinary people's perspective, right? Let's say like my mom, for example, I mean, like, uh, she doesn't know much about the U.S. and uh, like whatever she read from the Chinese domestic media about the U.S., you know, like she has a very, you know, like uh, interesting view, let's put it this way, like uh, toward the U.S. And uh, is that because like she has bad intentions? No, it's just like the type of information you receive, right? And uh, I, I mean, like uh, you can totally imagine like, you know, a reporter covering China, let's say from uh, New York or DC, you know, like uh, without much access to the, to, to, to the domestic group of people at large, how this person to get information about China? So I think like uh, it's uh, it's an unfortunate uh, you know state that uh, it's not really about like you know there are good players bad players it's because you know the whole trajectory of uh, geopolitical tensions and everything brought us to this stage and uh, it's gonna be a lose lose situation as well I mean like there's no winners to be honest maybe the last question yeah. for today um, yeah. As you mentioned, there are a lot of headlines that are sort of trying to create a narrative, right? But for individuals who did themselves want to be informed on what is actually happening and really understanding the nuances behind these geopolitical issues or to better understand China, what is some advice that you would give to these readers? Well, I think like in a sense that Singapore like playing or has played a very important role in a way that it's a bilingual, you know, like in you know, a multicultural state, you know, and uh, the benefits like for, you know, like anyone who can read, you know, both in Chinese and English, I think that really helps. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I mean, like, uh, I mean, like both sides, I mean, 
I think I can't remember whether that's from like Mark Twain or anyone like, you know, one of those like uh, famous, you know, like people in the world. He was saying like, you know, during the time of war, there's no news. There's only propaganda. And that comes from any state. You know, it's not just China or the U.S. or anyone. It's like uh, it's the nature of uh, our human history. So what I'm saying is like, you know, like uh, I would only, I, I, what I can do is like, you know, like to read varieties of information from both of the world and then like, you know, try to digest myself. There's really like no good to go to place, you know, like let's say I read this paper and they have like 100% accurate uh, non-biased information is impossible. Mm -hmm. So the best thing is to do is like to read multiple sources and, uh, and think with logic. Sometimes like when you read the headline, think about like when you read the news piece, you know, like you think you get like you, you take another layer down there. You think about, okay, is this possible? and why they want to do this. And if you think like this is not logically possible and like there's no intention for whatever like, you know, players like uh, to do this, like this, then like in that case, this news may not necessarily be like a true story. But, but, so uh, but, 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 but then the logic can be different, right? So, so for instance, I mean, there's lots of uh, abstract sort of portrayal of the Communist Party of China and uh, and 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 the, the ruling party of China, whether it's communist or whatever, I mean, they 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 are descended from lots of historical baggage or or history of China, which which makes them act and I think in a certain way, and that way might be different from what people outside would would, would naturally perceive. There, there 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 are certain things which are inbuilt in the logic of how the government, how the the, the establishments. Uh, act on certain things might be different from from the logic outside, but for outsiders, it's very difficult to understand that logic, right? Well, yes, that's definitely true. But mm -hmm. I think, like you know, like my practice has always been like you know, like uh, you look at from human nature. Humanity, mm -hmm. I think, is the same. Like uh, you know, whoever like, the person is, or whatever like the country is, or like the the the, the political state that people are at. You know, so what I'm saying is like you know. I mean, like, whatever this, uh, you know, like, uh, company or like any decision makers, right? Every time when they're trying to do something, to a certain extent, there has to like a human level, you know, like higher level or logic behind. If mm -hmm. this thing doesn't fit into like all these logics, you know, like why would this person still doing that? So I think that's a bigger question. So, or like, you know, like, uh, when, for example, like, right? There are lots of like, discussions or like stories about like, oh, you know, like uh, Timu, Shein, they're using like cheap labors, you know, like in order to get the cheaper price. So uh, like all, all kinds of stories. But the thing is like, you know, like you think about it, you know, like uh, the Nike, like H&M, like Zara, like all these companies are making productions like in China, right? I mean, like uh, if she and Timu, the only ones using cheap labors, like, would that even be possible? I mean, like, why wouldn't the, the all like the, the workers just work for, you know, somewhere paying a higher price, you know, like, uh, but willing to sacrifice everything to work for this, uh, these two companies only? I'm not saying that they they're paying a lot better than others, but what I'm saying is like, you know, it's just like, I mean, like, like in this business, I think everybody is like paying the cheaper price, you know, they they're not like unique in any sense, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I visited lots of uh, actually not lots of a couple a couple of Shein suppliers and on my own actually this year without like facilitation by by Shein and uh, and, and uh, amazingly that uh, I mean many of these people speak very highly of, of Shein. They said that okay, I mean we have difficulties attracting workers and Shein gave me subsidy so that I can install air conditioning in my in my workshop so 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 that I'm more competitive in attracting the workers compared to the others, but. Of course, immediately you never see this kind of stories coming out, and uh, and but but probably back to your to your problem, right? Nobody gets access to these these people, and these people when they talk to international media, they become very careful because they don't want to be like misquoted and because of the prevalent narrative out there. Uh, my last question. Yeah. How can we be optimistic about 2024? I mean, uh, when, when I look around, I mean, 2023 has been gloomy for everyone, and of of course there there are certain things which will probably not change in 2024. But uh, but uh, how to how to remain optimistic? 
Well, I felt like we're all going to be replaced by AI and uh, we don't have to work. That's something we can be very optimistic about. Uh, put jokes aside, I think, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, optis, optim, I mean, like, I'm a very optimistic person, like, by all means. So, like, uh, I always can find, like, something, like, to be very optimistic about. So, for example, I mean, like, uh, next year, I don't, I mean, like, Given like China, US, like both of the leaders they just met, I think like you know largely there won't be any like a uh, huge conflict in terms of like you know like uh, like military like uh, conflict or so like something like that. I don't think so. So that's something optimistic. Like uh, you, you you can't expect you know what I'm saying is like you have to set it like what I'm saying is like you have to set your expectation very low, so you can see everything very optimistic. You know, I think the problem for this year, as you mentioned, Jiang Gan, is that is that lots of people had, you know, like very very high expectations earlier of the year, right? They thought, okay, this is gonna be a like you know boom year, and mm -hmm. uh, and turns out it wasn't, and that's the gap made lots of people feel like you know either depressed or desperate. I think as long as people don't have any high expectations, then everything will be very much uh, rosy. And, uh, and of course, uh, and next year there will be the, the fun time uh, of the, I'm not sure what that uh, is politically correct to say that, but the fun time of US elections, right? I mean, with the potential of, 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 of Trump running and stuff, I mean, uh, nobody knows uh, what will happen between now and the election, but, uh, but, but definitely will not be an ordinary year, I guess, again. Yeah, that's a good point, right? I mean, like, particularly because people know this year will be the election year. And people mm -hmm. know, like, when during the time of election in the U.S., you know, it will be a, there could be tensions between China and the U.S. Mm. And that's precisely what I'm thinking. Like, because people have very low expectations towards the upcoming <laughs> year. So, like, as long as they don't have any, like, a very strong tensions, that's a good outcome. Because okay. last year, the problem was that people expect, you know, like, that was the year before the election. So like mm -hmm. the two countries will have like all kinds of like rosy things to do. And uh, it turns out it wasn't, or like it wasn't as, uh, as, as much as people expected. And that's the gap started. Yeah. Mm, that's, that, that's like uh, over the past, I don't know, two, 3,000 years, I mean, people in China have been able to, 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 to withstand through all the challenges, turmoil and stuff, uh, exactly by having no expectations. But anyway, <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I know it's a bit late uh, where you are. Yeah. It's, it's dark in your, in your background. And, uh, and of course, people, people like us in Singapore don't appreciate that. Uh, I mean, I don't know, traveling from office <laughs> to home actually takes time. <laughs> so thank uh -huh. you guys for listening to uh -huh. another episode of uh -huh. the Impulsive Podcast. And we'll see you again next week.